right. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the latest event in our angler event series, the biology of fly fishing. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the different organisms that fish eat, how to imitate them using artificial flies and what these organisms tell us about water quality. Um, this presentation is brought to you by the City of Worcester Lakes and Ponds Program and Mass Wildlife. My name is Jacqueline Burmeister and I coordinate the Lakes and Ponds Program in Worcester. The program works to monitor, manage water quality in our local waterways. A lot of the things that we do are collect and analyze water quality samples throughout the city and use them to help us decide what projects to perform at our waterways. We believe that resident engagement and angler uh, or just education is essential for keeping our blue spaces beautiful and that, um, but also that our waterways really offer these um, fun learning opportunities for people. So, as I mentioned, this program is part of the 2021 Angler Event Series, which, as its name suggests, is a series of events, 13 in total, that pertain to all things water quality, fish, and fishing. And the series is a collaboration between our local watershed associations to engage new and existing anglers in water quality challenges around the city and promote the great fishing that Worcester Lakes have to offer. So if you like this presentation, I'd encourage you to head over to wooanglerseries.com and sign up for some of the other ones that we have tonight. So tonight we have two special guests who are going to be tag teaming our presentation through fish diet, water quality, and fly tying. First, we have Jim Legacy from the Mass Wildlife Angler Education Program, who has been a tremendous partner in our angler event series and has a ton of experience and not just fishing, but also teaching people how to fish. And we also have Nick Pagan, who is the newest member of the Lakes and Ponds Program. He's an environmental scientist that has an educational background in macroinvertebrates or the bugs that our fish eat. He's also an angler. So, um, I'm really excited to have them tonight. This is a new program that they put together, especially for you all this evening. So there will be time for questions after the presentation and you'll be able to unmute yourself then, or if you would like during the presentation, feel free to type any questions that you have into the chat box. Also, this presentation is being recorded, so that will be available afterwards to share or go back to if you would like. So I think without further ado, we'll uh, jump right in and I'll hand it off to you, Jim. Thank you, Jacqueline. Can everyone see that? Thumbs up. All right. Well, thank you, Jacqueline, for that nice introduction. As Jacqueline said, my name is Jim Legacy. I coordinate Mass Wildlife Angler Education Program. I've been doing that for a long time. And generally, we're involved with beginner level um, fishing experiences, but recently in the last few years, we've added fly fishing, fly tying, ice fishing, um, adult fishing classes. So always tune into us if you want to learn something new about fishing and next level um, uh, events like tonight. Tonight is a next level event, the biology of fly fishing. And, and, and like uh, Jacqueline said, it's going to be tag team by myself and Nick Pagan. Nick is going to present, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about like the first part and the last part. Nick is going to take the, the meat of it, given his background in entomology and in aquatic ecology. So he's the perfect person for that. Um, spoiler alert, um, Nick and I love to fly fish. Uh, we know our aquatic insect groups, but not down to, you know, <laughs> a genus and species on all the Latin names. So we're not super into into that end of it. Um, so so if you are a citizen entomologist and or a, a longtime ardent fly angler looking for next level tips here, you might, this is geared kind of the beginner intermediate fly anglers. You, you might be a little underwhelmed. However, we invite you to stick around because we want to keep doing these and we want the comments, critiques, criticisms to make us better going forward. Um, the only way we're going to get better at doing these next level um, fishing uh, adventures is to hear from you and to, and to get help from you. So, so with that said, um, let's get into it. Fly fishing and biology, why the connection, what fish eat, important aquatic insect groups, why these, what these insects tell us about uh, our water quality, very important indicators, as are some of the fish we're going to talk about, and some of the flies that imitate these insects. We're going to get around to that as well. So fly fishing and biology, why that connection? I mean, 
Really? Is it, is, is it just about uh, fly fishing? Well, no, every method of fishing is dependent on the biological processes um, as, as we all are. So why the focus on fly fishing? Well, because fly fishing more than any other method of fishing is steeped in biology on several levels and is why many people embrace it. Many people get involved with fly fishing. They start with spin fishing. Oh, most people start walking before they can run. Um, but a lot of people will have a mentor and get right into fly fishing. But most people start with the spin fishing and then spinning, and then they want to, they want to, you know, anglers always want to challenge themselves. So they get into fly fishing. And a great part of fly fishing is the biology that's all intertwined in it. What fish eat in particular is, is a big part of that. And all fish, um, or, or have to uh, focus on the entomology within their system, but none more than than uh, the trout and in what uh, people fly fish for. So, it, like I just said, all fish can be targeted using a fly rod. But tonight we're going to focus mostly on trout. Uh, we feel that more uh, people do focus on trout when the, when they're fly fishing. Um, and and trout more than any other species are absolutely dependent on aquatic macroinvertebrates. And Nick is going to really elaborate on that. However, don't let it stop you from bass fishing or sun fishing or saltwater fishing with that fly rod. Um, we always recommend if you're just starting fly fishing to actually focus on warm water species. So bluegills, pumpkin seeds, bass, uh, and, and, and the like, panfish, because from the months of May through October, they're much more obliging. They're easier to catch. You'll get your chops catching them. You'll 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 gain that knowledge on how to set the hook, and you'll just become um, that much more um, involved in in adept at fly fishing. But then you're going to graduate to trout, which are a little more difficult to catch. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. Not necessarily our stock trout that we're putting out right now, but as trout naturalize and trout that that, that were reproduced naturally within streams. Are, are very picky about what they eat, the time of day they eat it, the conditions where they're eating it. So, um, so that is something you have to be concerned with. And, and that is why a lot of people focus on fly fishing and get right into focusing on trout. So in talking about trout, trout, and we're gonna talk about this more in depth, trout are a cold water species. Um, those that, that fly fish for trout know this, they're an important sport and food fish for us throughout North America, the world, and in Massachusetts. We have three larger groups of trout here in Massachusetts, the Pacific trout and salmon represented very well by our rainbow trout. Massachusetts um, annually stocks in the spring 500,000-ish fish and probably a half to two thirds of those are our rainbow trout raised at our flagship hatchery in, in uh, Belchertown, the McLaughlin State Fish Hatchery. So that is actually a Pacific trout and salmon, the rainbow trout. We have Atlantic trout and salmon as well, the land, represented by landlocked salmon and brown trout. Those are the salars, those, those are um, um, well represented here. Landlocked salmon in Wachusett and Quabbin Reservoir, sometimes spilling into the Swift River when, when Quabbin spills over. Um, and we stock about 10,000 within those systems every year. Brown trout, we stock hundreds of thousands within different systems. Um, and then the char, so the lake trout and the brook trout are, are species of char um, that we put out. Lake trout are, are um, only in Wachusett and Quabbin Reservoir, unless someone's done a little nighttime stocking where they shouldn't have. Quabbin and Wachusett Reservoirs are where you find lake trout, um, old, very old lived species. Um, Put in the reservoirs almost 100 years old now and, and you could probably find some of the lake trout that were in the initial stockings in the 30s and 40s still living in in um, in the quabbin reservoir they can live 50 60 70 years and then brook trout are also chars related to lake trout um, that we stock quite a few of and if you want the, the native experience or the naturalized experience the wild experience go to the swift river one of our catch and release areas on our great fly fishing rivers and you can catch uh, there's thousands and thousands of brook trout in that system and we don't stock them they just naturally reproduce now so trout in massachusetts that's a quick synopsis I'm going to talk about three larger biological kind of frameworks that that you should focus on if you're into fly fishing and trout fishing in particular, and none more important than water quality. Trout are given that they're a cold water species, they need those cold, clean waters. And why do they? Why are they noted as a cold water species? Um, well, because they need more oxygen. They need to take in more dissolved oxygen in cold water. Um, holds more dissolved oxygen. Um, 
So you're going to see this this thermometer here in front of you, and you're going to see the trout represent the bottom of that thermometer down into the upper 40s to low 60s. The the brown trout can take the widest range, even up into the mid 60s, where they can still thrive and are relatively comfortable. The lake trout absolutely start to you know, become miserable if temps get into the mid 50s. So they go down deep, they find deeper, colder water, which the Quabbin Wachusett Reservoirs absolutely provide. But there, there are our northernmost char that's here, and they definitely like the, the coldest water. And then in between, you have the rainbow trout, the brook trout, the, the salmon um, that can take a, a variety within the 50s and 60s. So cold water, cold water holds more oxygen. They seek that out. So this time of year, um, you can still catch them inshore. You can catch our stock trout inshore. Um, April and May are great months, but then you get into June and it really warms up. You're gonna need some way to access the deeper water habitat or focus in rivers with a lot of moving water that's interacting with, with the air that gets a lot more oxygen turned into the system, but really look for that cold, those cold water habitats. Um, and, and you're gonna see the other species, the warm water fish now are gonna start to come into their own. They're gonna start to thrive, to reproduce, um, to eat. So that's why we always say, if you're fly fishing and just starting, start with warm water fish. So they also need within the water quality um, realm, they need complex and diverse habitats. We kind of like this. We like those easy wading streams and rivers where, where you can walk right down to the bank, um, those culverts that kind of separate um, we we like it because we're kinda, when we fish and we're kind of lazy, but it doesn't do the trout any favors. The trout love love me, I like to say messy habitats, and this is these are a couple of slides that were credited that I put, took off the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website. Our, our friends up in Vermont they have this great great um, uh, little page about trout what trout need, and I couldn't resist this one. So credit to Vermont Fish and Wildlife. They like messy complex systems. Um, diverse have riffles and pools, boulders, trees falling in, and riparian habitats. So riparian zones are where you have um, growth, um, terrestrial growth right down to the water's edge. So you have this buffer zone, also known as a riparian zone, that's blocking a lot of um, a lot of nutrient overloading and a lot of um, you know pesticides and, and and things that are harmful to the system. The, the picture on the right, there's no riparian zone. So the, this whole farm field, phosphates and nitrates can load into that system and it's very poor for the, very bad for the water, but also very bad for the species that limit, live in it, the aquatic insects and the, and the trout. So look for this type of habitat and you'll find happy trout and a lot of happy insects. Culverts that are deeper, more modern, that fish can move, not these old ones that are impediments in, like dams that are also impediments to, to fish movement. So, so that's the biological end of things. This is this is a concept that a lot of uh, fly fishermen, real, fly anglers, I should say, fly uh, fishing women and men get into and love about the biology. It's such a challenge. It's a little overstated in my opinion, um, but it's a it, there is no better challenge than trying to match what you see coming off the water to what you tied in your fly box tied on the end and actually trick that fish into biting that offering. So that's the simplest version of matching the hatch. You walk down to a river and you're seeing the, uh, a certain species of mayfly hatching off the river or coming down to lay their eggs in the spinning, the, the last life stage of the mayfly and laying there prostrate dying. And then you have a spinner fly that you tied that you can match that hatch with. And nothing's better than that feeling. It really, Works out so simply though, <clears throat> matching the hatch can be a real head scratching conundrum. And I've experienced it trying to trying to see exactly what they're eating and, and have the same fly and they weren't taking it. Um, so it's a super challenge and one of the biggest challenges through all fishing, even if you're just throwing worms or, 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 or shiners in the water with spinning gear, but matching the hatch is one of the main reasons people get involved in, in, in fly fishing and in the biology of it, because it's such a challenge. And some examples are <clears throat> this March brown mayfly. Um, it's it's a big may hatching fly. You'll try and you try and tie something that imitates that. Um, over here you have stonefly larvae and various larvae imitators of the stonefly that you're trying to trying to seek to match. And then down here, good old streamers that are that are imitating <clears throat> your bait fish. So it's not just um, limiting it to the insects, even though that's what mostly we're talking about tonight, but matching the hatch is really trying to focus on what fish are eating. Some of the bigger fish, in fact, the brown trout really tee off on smaller fish. So um, as they get bigger, it's all about energy in and energy out. 
um, and they're going to be focusing on a bigger meal. So those bigger brown trout are going to be looking for smaller fish. So if you can match it with a larger streamer, you're having a lot more success than a midge, perhaps. And then there's also um, trying to match the hatch for stocked trout. This is called a pellet fly. <laughs> um, this, this might be a little pedestrian to a lot of fly anglers, but it's it's a fly. It's just a chunk of yarn or chenille that you can tie to match a, a brown or a black pellet. You know, that, that's what the fish eat in our in our farm raised hatcheries. And then when we put them out, they are looking for that for a while until they naturalize. And in the fall, when when they're spawning, these are egg patterns you can tie pretty easily with, with a variety of materials too. And then there's there's these mop flies that can imitate a wide range of things, very simple to tie, but also mostly just um, imitating like case caddis um, flies. So those are just examples of matching the hatch. The sky's the limit with it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the flies in a bit. The other thing that I, and I thought would be really interesting for folks, if you haven't heard about it, is phenology, not to be confused with phylogeny. For you citizen scientists, phylogeny is more the, the uh, study of evolutionary um, similarities between different uh, groups, orders, and species, that type of thing. Phenology is kind of the cyclical and seasonal natural phenomena that, that, um, that, 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 that comes together um, that you can see clues and, and similarities in certain species and in animals. Um, so with respect to fly fishing, it's kind of neat. Um, I, I totally stole this from one of our instructors. And I don't think Tom's watching tonight, but um, Tom Rosinski, a longtime angler ed instructor, um, big into fishing the Adirondack waterways, which is you know, some of the more awesome waterways in the Northeast. Um, he put together this article and we're going to send this to you as is added content uh phonology with respect to fly fishing called blooming hatches so um this is where you really take matching the hatch to another level um and, and it simplifies it in some ways but you have to be very observant so you, it's, he recommends you keep a journal and then and then take this journal over the years to kind of match what's going on in the river to what's growing up going on, on on the land so matching the terrestrial with the aquatic um, and it's really, really interesting. So in its simplest form, like right now, apple blossoms are out on the shoreline and the Hendrickson, Hendrickson's hatch is going on. This was, this was in the Adirondack, so it's a little different. It's a little um, later up there. It's a couple weeks later. But then, then, that's, then you use the spinner version of that, the rusty spinner fall, um, to match that. So if you see the apple blossoms, have that rusty spinner in your fly box. And then you worry less about matching um, just, oh, the apples are blossom, the apple trees are blossoming. Boom. I know that, that something in my box is going to work. So he takes that to a whole new science. He has an entire PowerPoint on that. Maybe I can twist his arm to someday uh, present that to us. But this is just one of his uh, quick little synopsis is here from May and June in the Adirondacks, which he makes the point too that you really have to um, localize it for your microclimate. What's going on in the Adirondacks is not going to be the same as what's going on in the Cape or the Northeast or in Maine, for that matter. It's going to be a little different. So keeping that journal while you're out there and being very observant, following the biology is going to help you down the road. And it's also going to be interesting, like he says, in the winter when you're tying those flies, looking at the journal to what you should build on, what you should build your your fly box up with. So, so. I walked out the door today and our lilacs uh, in our side yard were already blooming. It seems early to me, probably not the first week of, of May. So you'd look at this and in June, literally June, uh, well, actually late, late May and June and where he's fishing the central Adirondacks, the lilacs were blooming through his, through his records. So then you're gonna use uh, sulfurs and you're gonna see March browns hatching and sulfurs and cinnamon sedges and black caddis. So, and then these are the very simple flies that you're going you're gonna to tie to match those. And, and I'm gonna give you that article as, as that next level stuff. And you can see how it easy it really is this system he has down. So phonology with respect to fly fishing is indeed um, one, of the, one of the neatest things you can incorporate into your fly fishing, the biological aspect. So with that said now, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to uh, Nicholas Pagan, who's going to take it from here, and then you're going to get me back droning on toward the end of the presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. All right. So as uh, thanks again to Jim for, for your excellent presentation so far, and thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Nick Pagan. 
Uh, I work for the City of Worcester Water Department. I've been there for about three years working with drinking water, but I recently started working more with our Lakes and Ponds program. Uh, so I do the, um, the water monitoring side of things. So, you know, out, I'm out in the field uh, every week uh, monitoring the lakes and ponds in Worcester. And I also help out with our uh, the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative, which I think I'm going to mention a bit later. Um, but also outside of my professional life, as uh, Jim and Jacqueline also said, you know, I, I'm an enthusiastic fly angler. And I think as with many people in this field, um, that is really what got me into science. Um, you know, as a small child, I, I was interested in fly fishing and that really sparked my interest in everything that's going on in the natural world. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna uh, kind of try to make more of this connection between biology and fly fishing. I'm gonna start with, you know, generally what fish eat. Uh, I'm gonna move on to talking more specifically about some of our aquatic invertebrates, uh, which are some of the more important uh, food sources for the fish that we like to chase on fly rods and fish in general. And then I'm going to talk about what those invertebrates can say about the uh, lakes and streams that we like to fish in. Um, so uh, what do fish eat? It's an incredibly important question when we're thinking about what we wanna tie on the end of our line. Um, now, for anybody that fishes for trout, um, we know that they can be quite selective, but as Jim said, I also agree that, uh, you know, that point is often a little bit overstated. Um, you know, it, it often comes down to conditions and presentation as well as fly selection. Um, and uh, trout and basically every other fish species are opportunistic feeders. That means that if there is something in front of them that they recognize as food, and they have the energy to go get it and the conditions are right for them to go get it, they're gonna eat it. Um, so, you know, what they're eating depends on, you know, the habitat that they live in. Um, so, you know, you're gonna find different food sources in uh, kind of a shallow pond versus a high mountain stream. Um, it depends on the availability of that food. So, you know, are, are you seeing primarily crayfish in one habitat? Are you seeing primarily caddisflies? Um, and it also depends on environmental conditions. Uh, so say if it's a really cold day, um, it's likely that, you know, the fish isn't gonna have a lot of energy to be uh, chasing around smaller fish. So they'll likely be eating, um, you know, small insects on the, the, uh, in the benthos or the, the bottom of the water body. Uh, whereas if the conditions are just right for them to be moving all around, it's much more likely that they'll be a little bit more animated. So the environmental conditions can kind of shape what fish eat in their environments. Um, so another thing that I think uh, Jim was talking about earlier, it's the energy in, energy out idea. Fish balance the caloric richness of the food that they're eating with the energy they use to get it. Um, so if you look at the two photos on the bottom, um, there's a large mouth bass that looks like it just chased down maybe, maybe a crappie or a rainbow trout. Um, and to get that, that big piece of food, it probably had to expend a lot of energy. So it had to, to chase it down and snatch it. Um, and that is a big energy expenditure, but that is also a big energy reward. Um, so it probably doesn't have to eat for the rest of the day or maybe for the next couple of days. Uh, whereas if you look at the rainbow trout on the other side, it's just kind of sitting in the current and slowly sipping mayflies off the surface. Uh, so it does have to work against the current a little bit, um, but it's, that's not a huge energy expenditure, especially where it's probably sitting. Um, but that means because the mayfly is much smaller than that fish that the bass is eating, it has to eat those mayflies a lot more frequently. So it's probably eating a mayfly every 30 seconds or every minute or two. Um, so it needs to be eating all day to maintain the same amount of calories that that bass is taking in in one fell swoop. Um, so, you know, you need to think about those things when you're selecting uh, flies for the, the fish that you're going after and in the specific conditions that you're in. Um, so continuing on uh, with what fish eat, uh, we know that, you know, a lot of fish eat bait fish, as, as Jim was talking about, it's a golden shiner. Um, you know, they also will eat terrestrial insects, so things like uh, grasshoppers, beetles will fall into the water, spiders will fall into the water, as well as the earthworms that we will put on our hooks when we're bait fishing. 
Um, they'll also smaller fish, uh, such as, uh, you know, the bait fish that we're looking at, as well as pan fish will sometimes eat zooplankton. Um, you know, amphibians are sometimes on the menu, things like salamanders and frogs. I'm sure you've seen um, frog imitations, especially in spinning tackle. Um, those can be kind of cool, um, as well as even small mammals. You know, it's uh, it's not uncommon for a large brown trout to, to feed on mice. I know that a lot of people uh, have experienced some pretty uh, exciting fishing using mouse flies at night for a large brown trout, something I, re I really want to experience at some point. Um, but, you know, kind of the bread and butter of a lot of fish's diets uh, is maybe a less charismatic character, it's aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, so that name is sometimes a little bit intimidating. Uh, generally, we're talking about aquatic bugs, so bugs that live in the water. Um, so aquatic macroinvertebrates, you know, they're aquatic, so they live in the water. Um, they're macro, which in this context means they're, you know, generally larger than 500 microns. Um, that means that you can basically see them with your naked eye. They're not smaller than what you can see with your naked eye. Um, and they're invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone. They don't have a vertebrae. Um, they're an incredibly diverse group of organisms. Um, so they, they range from mollusks to aquatic worms to, um, you know, stoneflies and caddisflies, and they live in just about every aquatic environment on Earth. Um, so you'll find them as deep as the bottom of the deepest lake on Earth, Lake Bacal, to the, uh, as high as, you know, the high mountain lakes in the Himalayas. Um, they live in the uh, effluent of nuclear power plants, and they live in the most pristine uh, trout streams on Earth. Um, so there's a very wide range of what they can tolerate and the types of environments that they like. Um, so some type of invertebrate lives in basically every aquatic environment on Earth, no matter how inhospitable. Um, they're also incredibly ecologically important. Um, so they link primary producers, so things that transfer the sun's energy um, into energy that can be used by organisms, uh, such as phytoplankton and plants as well as detritus, uh, which is kind of decomposing organic material on the bottom of the water body into energy that can be used by um, fish, amphibians, and birds. So, you know, by eating what they do and then being eaten by the things that they do, they're transferring that energy from primary producers and from detritus back up into the higher levels of the food chain. And that's an incredibly important link in the, in. Uh, uh, freshwater food webs. Um, so they also serve multiple ecological roles within those. So they are they're doing all kinds of important jobs within those environments. They fill lots of important niches, um, such as, you know, there are shredders and collectors and grazers, as well as, uh, you know, there are some aquatic macroinvertebrates that are predators to other aquatic macroinvertebrates, like uh, dragonfly larvae. Um, so I'm not going to go too deeply into the ecological roles, but just to know that they are um, serve many important roles within the ecosystems. Um, so here's just a very broad uh, overlook of the um, aquatic macroinvertebrates. This is not a taxonomic key. Um, this is more based on common traits, but just so you can see that there is an incredible diversity among these organisms. So everything from mollusks to um, fly larvae to, um, you know, stone flying caddis fly larvae. We'll find all types of different um, forms within aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the most important invertebrates for anglers to know about when you're selecting flies. Uh, and these are going to be mostly stream invertebrates, but there are plenty that also are found in lakes and ponds that you can use in warm water environments as well. So the first one I'm going to talk about is mayflies. Um, so, you know, these are often uh, invertebrates that often live in streams. Um, the stage that you'll see the most often is their larval stage, which you see in the two on top. Um, now, when I talk about these insects, I'm mostly going to be talking on the order level, so I'm not going to be going down to genus and species just for the sake of time and my own knowledge. I'm, you know, much more knowledgeable on the order level, um, but 
so, so, you know, you were looking at the larval stage of these organisms. That's most of what trout eat, um, although they do eat plenty of the uh, adults when they're present. Um, and then here are the adults on the bottom. Here's uh, what we think of as a dun on the, uh, on the right side and a spinner on the left side. I'm going to go more into the life cycle of mayflies uh, just after this. Um, so it's, it's important to know about the life cycles of all of these insects if you want to, um, you know, properly imitate them to the fish. Uh, because many of these stages um, take different forms and are in different parts of the water column, but just about all of them are important uh, for uh, fish predation. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is the larval stage. Um, so mayfly larvae uh, live underwater for about a year. Um, you know, they live in the rocks and gravel. You know, for any of these in invertebrates, um, you can turn over rocks in the stream and look at what's in there and you can kind of see what's living in the stream. And I, I recommend that for anybody that is interested just in the general life uh, that's living in the water body that you're fishing in. Uh, it's always interesting to check under the rocks and to, to see what's living there. Um, so larvae will often come uh, dislodged from rocks and sometimes in the early morning, they'll dislodge themselves so they can float to new places and um, you know, rehabitate new areas when they want to find more food. Uh, eventually, when it comes time for them to mate, they will go to the surface of the water and entrain themselves in the film at the surface and emerge into their flying form. This is an incredibly important stage for um, imitating as a fly angler because they are very vulnerable to predation at this point. Uh, they can't do much uh, to get away from a trout when they are entrained in the surface film. They can be there sometimes for, for a little while. Um, so oftentimes when you see fish rising to, to uh, insects on the surface, it may look like they're rising to the done form. And that's often what is imitated in Catskill style dry flies, as well as, um, you, know, you know, a lot of the more traditional dry flies. But um, most of the time, they're in fact taking the emerging insects if, if it's an emergence event that's happening. Um, so after they emerge out of the water, they'll fly into the trees uh, and bushes surrounding the stream, as well as sometimes the rocks. They'll kind of uh, unfold their wings and dry out um, and de start developing into the full adult form. And this is called the done phase. Uh, eventually, after a couple days, they will kind of form mating flights and the, the insects will mate. Um, and these mating flights can often be very beautiful and they'll, they'll um, kind of circle around the water. Um, and eventually the gravid females will lay their eggs on the surface of the water. And then as Jim was saying earlier, they will um, they'll then die on the surface of the water and their wings will splay out. And this is called the spinner form. Um, so this is also a very important uh, form of the insect uh, to imitate when, when a spinner fall is happening. Uh, so these are all things to kind of look out for. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the life cycle of all these insects. I would love to, um, but we just don't have time for it. Um, but I'll try to bring in some of the, uh, you know, other processes within the life cycles of the other insects as I go along. So. On to caddis flies. These are another important stream insect. Um, you know, they, they often run in or live in freestone streams, fast flowing oxygenated streams, although there are some species that live in still waters as well. Um, in their larval stage, um, you know, you'll see them in a couple different forms. Uh, the first one on top is a case making caddis. Um, these will live kind of where the mayflies do in the rocks and gravel. Um, but they make little cases out of whatever the substrate of the stream is. So they'll make cases out of little pebbles and little pieces of sticks and uh, leaves. And it's actually kind of a good way of seeing what the stream is made out of uh, because they'll use kind of whatever is there. They'll even make cases out of precious metals and gemstones when people put them in those uh, in, into situations with them. People will often make earrings uh, that are made by caddis flies uh, in that. I think I have a picture of that later on. Um, so there are case-making caddis flies. There are also free-living caddis flies. I think this one is a hydropsyche. 
um, and these will spin nets to catch uh, detritus and sometimes algae in the current. Uh, and that's that's one of the uh, ecological roles that they take. Um, when they move into emergence, they will go into a distinct pupil phase. So that's uh, on the bottom left here. They look relatively different. And this is one of the biggest um, stages that trout like to eat. They're uh, you know big and juicy at that point. They're easy to see for trout, and they are very vulnerable because they're swimming from the bottom of the water column to the surface to, to emerge. Um, so it's a place where often during a, um, a hatch, that's where the fish will go to, uh, to eat them. And then just kind of like mayflies, they entrain in the surface of the water, and they crawl out of their pupil sheath and um, emerge into the flying caddisflies like on the bottom right. Um, and these caddisfly adults will live outside of the water for a little bit longer than mayflies, usually somewhere between like a week and a month. So if you see caddisflies flying around the stream, it, it can sometimes be a little bit misleading because um, you don't know exactly when they emerged. Um, so you really want to make sure that if, if you see caddisflies around and you want to tie one on as an adult, um, that you want to see them coming off the water uh, because if they're flying around, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the fish are eating at the moment. Um, all right, so moving on to so stoneflies. Um, these are another, um, these almost exclusively live in streams. Um, they generally live in our highest quality, most oxygenated, cleanest waters. They're very sensitive to um, environmental stress. Um, they start off in the larval form, uh, which are generally pretty noticeable. Um, they can be relatively large, although some are, are also pretty small, depending on the species. Um, some of them have these very distinct markings on their backs, um, although some of the small black stone flies are a bit less ostentatious. Um, when they emerge out of the water, instead of uh, climbing up into the surface film, they'll climb onto rocks and just crawl out of their um, their exoskeletons. So you can often tell when uh, stoneflies have been emerging uh, by looking at the rocks on the side of the stream and looking for these exoskeletons. Um, and then on the right, you can see a couple of examples of what the adults look like. So they can be, you know, these kind of large, dark salmon flies. Um, and then they they can also be a little bit daintier, like this this little this little um, I think it's a golden stone. I'm not positive. Um, all right, now moving on to midges. So I think midges are um, one of the unfortunately most underappreciated of the aquatic invertebrates. I, I did my master's research on them, so I have a special place in my heart for them. Um, but uh, they're they're not quite as uh, as beautiful as some of the other. Uh, macroinvertebrates, but I, I think they're pretty cool. They're the most diverse, um, or, or yeah, the most diverse group of the macroinvertebrates. Um, they are under the um, order Diptera, so they're related to other true flies. So things like, yeah, generally flies, they're pretty closely related to mosquitoes, and they're often mistaken for mosquitoes in their adult form. Um, they start off as larvae that live, live underwater, and they're very, very small. Um, so in fly fishing terms, you know, you're looking at a hook size between, you know, 20 and 28, like the smallest hooks you could possibly find. And if anybody out there has used that size hook, uh, it is, it is no fun. <laughs> I am not a fan of it. Although Get your magnifying glass out, big time. Yeah, especially on the Swift River. Um, but so they start off in the larval form, uh, midges have a distinct pupil form. They, um, kind of, uh, gather, um, uh, bubbles in their pupil sheath and float themselves to the surface of the water where, where they'll emerge in the, into the flying insects. Um, at this point, they will often form large clusters on the surface of the water. Um, and this can be a form that is, is very enticing to fish. And there are some flies that actually um, imitate the clusters instead of individual insects, which is a little bit easier for us to see. Um, and believe it or not, 
Um, as small as they are, they can be very important food sources for large trout, especially in tailwaters such as the Swift or the Farmington. Um, so, so, you know, midges are not to be discounted, although they are very small and not very beautiful to look at. Um, and then we're moving on to some, some other macroinvertebrates that are important not only in cold water, but also in warm water ecosystems. Um, so looking at dragonflies and damselflies. Um, so we have a damselfly larvae on the left and an adult damselfly below it. And then a dragonfly larvae on the right and the adult below it. Um, and they are the predators of the macroinvertebrate communities. Um, these are really good for warm water fishing. So I've, I've tied a number of um, a number of imitations of these that are just killer for pan fish and for bass. I've caught plenty of bass on, on dragonfly and dam damselfly larvae. Uh, and you can often use a, uh, uh, an olive woolly bugger that's relatively small to imitate these. Um, so I would, would not discount these at all for, for fly anglers. Another few important insects to think about that are, again, not quite as charismatic um, are leeches. Um, leeches are probably my favorite insect to, uh, to imitate. Um, they are very important food sources for just about every fish. Um, they're big and juicy. They are easy to see in the water for the fish and they're relatively defenseless. Um, and a, uh, a black woolly bugger is something that's always in my box to imitate leeches. Um, as many bass anglers know, crayfish are also incredibly important, not only for bass, but also for trout. Um, crane fly larvae uh, are another one that's really good to imitate, um, as well as amphipods, so scuds and sow bugs. Um, those are kind of like freshwater shrimp, and they're very important, especially in limestone streams down in Pennsylvania as well as our tailwaters up here, such as the Swift and the Farmington. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the aquatic invertebrates um, that I'll talk about today. There are plenty more that are important, but those are some of the big ones. Um, now I'm gonna kind of move on to some of the, some of the more biology oriented stuff. Uh, I wanna talk about how you can use these aquatic invertebrates to understand what's going on in your water bodies. Uh, but to do that, we need to talk a little bit more, a little bit more about the threats to our aquatic ecosystems that we can experience. And now Jim, Jim talked about a lot of the uh, habitat requirements, uh, and I just want to kind of expand on that a little bit more. Um, so as as Jim was talking about earlier, uh, nutrient inputs, excess nutrients in our freshwater ecosystems, such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium. Um, can be really detrimental to, to our aquatic ecosystems. Um, you know, those excess nutrients lead to the overgrowth of um, all types of algae, you know, green algae, uh, golden algae, as well as cyanobacteria, as well as aquatic plants. So especially invasive species that we're often dealing with in our lakes, ponds, and streams. Um, now, these excess nutrient inputs can lead to a process called eutrophication, where it kind of drastically alters the structure of the environment in these, in these aquatic ecosystems and uh, leads to the overgrowth of these um, aquatic plants and algae, um, as well as a lot of other negative, um, potential negative impacts. And one of those impacts that we see, you know, sometimes in the lakes and ponds here and around the country is harmful algal blooms. Um, so this is when you have excess nutrient inputs, you know, coming, coming in from around the water body, either through, um, through tributaries, uh, direct runoff, or, you know, through, um, you know, storm grates and things like that um, from fertilizers, uh, that people use in lawns, as well as um, as well as uh, goose droppings around the pond, and other things like that. Uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, especially when they're caused by cyanobacteria, um, can lead to um, toxins in the cyanotoxins in the water that can be harmful to pets, as well as to people who are recreating in the water bodies. Um, these uh, the proliferation of algal species as well as invasive plants 
when when those algae start or when those plants and algae start to decompose can also cause a condition called anoxia um, where when the decomposers overpopulate when they're um, decomposing those um, aquatic primary producers, um, they will start to reduce the amount of oxygen in the water column and can lead to fish kills and to other negative impacts on the water bodies. Um, oxygen depletion is also a big issue when it comes to increasing water temperatures because warmer water um, can hold less and less oxygen as it gets warmer. Um, so especially as you're fishing for trout, as the water reaches about uh, the high 60s and especially around 70 degrees, you really don't wanna stress them out um, anywhere past there uh, because that decreased oxygen and the, the increased stress that you cause it as an angler can really uh, harm, harm those fish species. Um, so increasing water temperatures in due to habitat changes as well as global climate change um, can be really negatively impact, especially our cold water species. Um, also, habitat degradation is a big a, a big concern, especially in our streams. Um, you know, in New England, we have seen uh, you know a lot of damming and redirection of our of our streams that have over time been restored, uh, but you'll still see channelization in streams, like is shown on the right. Uh, you know, when these streams are are channelized, uh, you reduce the uh, really important complexity that Jim was talking about earlier. Um, you reduce all of the little microhabitats that those invertebrates that I'm talking I was talking about like to live in. Um, so we want to see. Uh, you know, the most comp complex and most um, the most um, kind of topsy turvy environments that we can. And then I think I, yeah, I missed toxic runoff from roads, lawns, and industry. Those can also negatively impact a lot of the more sensitive invertebrate species that I, I've talked about so far. So now we're going to go into kind of the um, specifics about what the bugs I was talking about can tell us about ecosystem quality. Um, so, some in, because aquatic macroinvertebrates are such a diverse and dynamic group, um, some of them are more sensitive to stress than others. Um, and those ones that are really sensitive to stress are often called indicator species. Um, so that means that you know they can't really uh, they need very special conditions to live. They need highly oxygenated water. They need very clear water because their gills can get uh, clogged up very easily. They need relatively specialized uh, habitats to live in. Um, so when these indicator species are present, it generally means that the water is high quality. And when they're absent when they should be present, it means that there's maybe a problem going on. Um, so along with these very special indicator species, um, you can also see uh, the diversity of uh, invertebrates in the ecosystem can show um, you know, the general health of the ecosystem. Um, and when there is greater diversity, it's, uh, it helps with ecological resiliency in the face of some of the stresses that we were talking about. So, you know, if one, one uh, group of invertebrates gets knocked out, another one will come in to fill its role within the ecosystem. Uh, and below here, I just thought I'd point out, this is the, the picture of the caddisflies that um, have been forced to make some some jewelry for humans. Uh, so I just thought I'd point that out. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the invertebrates that indicate higher water quality. Um, so, you know, some of the insects I talked about, mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies, especially in our stream environments, uh, will indicate uh, higher water quality. Now, within these orders, um, there are even more sensitive and specialized taxa. Um, you know, you know, generally seeing mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies means that you're in, in pretty good condition. Um, but there are certain species that indicate, you know, especially high water quality or certain very rare species that are a really good sign if you find them. I don't have the time to go into exactly, you know, the, the species that indicate the highest water quality. But generally, if you see these, and especially multiple species of them, you're in pretty good shape as in a stream environment. Whereas there are 
other taxa that we think of as tolerant of lower water quality. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that if you see them, your water quality is bad. On the contrary, they're basically found everywhere. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find any water body that doesn't have, you know, mid larvae or doesn't have leeches. Um, the real problem that you run into is when this is all you're seeing and when the diversity of these is very low. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see midges or dragonfly larvae, damselfly larvae, leeches, uh, crayfish in just about any water body you encounter. Um, but if you're seeing those without some of the more um, specialized and indicator species, then, you know, that might be an indicator that you have um, some environmental stress in your system. Um, so I think I only have about two more slides. I apologize I've been, if I've been going kind of fast. I just have had a lot to cover. Um, and please feel free to put any questions you have in the comments or, or save them for the end. Um, but, and I'm happy to answer whatever I can. Uh, but I have two more slides that are going to go through uh, just a couple examples of, um, you know, what you might find in a really high quality um, uh, environment versus, you know, an environment that's experiencing some stress. So we're going to kind of pretend that we're, uh, we're scientists and we're marking out a couple transects in, in water bodies and we're going to, you know, put, put down a, a, a square in each one and pick out whatever insects is in that square, identify them, and then see what that tells us. Um, so for the first example, um, we have, uh, here are all the insects that we see in this square. Uh, we see a lot, you know, a few midge larvae. Um, we see, uh, you know, a species of mayfly. We see another species of mayfly. There are a few individuals of those. Uh, we see a couple species of caddisflies and a stonefly larvae. We also see a, you know, a damselfly and a leech. So generally, you know, there's pretty good diversity in here, and we're seeing some of those more sensitive uh, invertebrates. Um, so you could uh, say that this is probably uh, a water body with relatively high water quality. You know, this is indicating that, you know, there aren't a lot of environmental stressors on this the ecosystem or the environmental stressors aren't getting in the way of the biology so much. Um, and then we look at our second water body and we're seeing some of the same players. We see a lot of midge larvae. We see some, some leeches and some dragonflies, but we're not seeing a lot of those indicator species. We see a couple mayflies, but there isn't a lot of diversity of them. Um, and, you know, among the rest of the organisms, there isn't a whole lot of diversity. Um, so we're seeing mostly just tolerant, tolerant invertebrates um, and not a lot of the indicator species. Um, and if this is a flowing stream where you'd expect, you know, more of these, um, more of these uh, higher quality stream insects, um, you can assume that it's experiencing, you know, one of the environmental stressors that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, this is just generally some some things to look out for when you're at your, your favorite stream or your favorite lake. Um, and I think, you know, generally looking for the aquatic invertebrates that live in those ecosystems will help out your fishing, uh, but it'll also help your understanding generally of what's going on in your water body. Um, so uh, Jim is going to take take it back over with the, uh, the flies that you can use to imitate these things. And uh, again, I just want to thank everybody for listening and uh, I'll talk to you during the question section. All right, I'm going to I'm going to get out of the sharing screen and hand it over to Jim. Thank you, Nick. That was awesome. Out of the park, buddy. Um, I learned a lot too. <laughs> a lot of stuff that I had forgotten since college, but um, I love his point about, you know, all those species, leeches included. People have a connotation about leeches that they're just god awful. And if you find them, that, that, that that's a bad, bad, bad thing. They all like um, good quality water. Um, they just have a wider tolerance. They can handle more so that, like you said, the dragonflies, the leeches, that kind of thing. So don't be too put off if you're seeing them. But if you're only seeing them, like he says, that's the. The, 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 you know, the kind of canary in the coal mine thing, you, you don't want to see just a certain few and too many of them. Um, and that's the, the good thing about fly anglers. 
generally once they get into fly fishing, um, they get a little bit more passionate about their pastime and they care more about the environment because they want it to last. They want it to be around. So so they they start noticing things. A lot of fly anglers, you know, and in groups like Trout Unlimited really bring up certain things to um, and work with environmental groups to try and clean these waterways up or at least to spotlight them so we know if there's an issue. So fly anglers can definitely be um, be that for for the fishing group and all anglers can indeed. So let me try and get ahead. Okay, so we're we are just going to quickly show a few flies just to give you a good example. Um, there is there is thousands of flies, folks, and new ones coming up every day. And 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 to Nick's point, every group, and I'm just going to talk about the major, uh, the four major um, orders here um, because those are the ones that are imitated the most. But don't overlook the the ephemeropter, the dragonflies, and the damselflies, and and the leeches and the crayfish and all those others because there's tons of patterns there. And I love the point, Nick, about the mouse pattern. <laughs> Swift River is well noted for huge brown trout and some people exclusively go and fish them with mouse patterns at night and come up with some really big brown trout. Uh, and, and that's another thing about brown trout, they like feeding at night. They're very night, uh, they're very more nocturnal than diurnal. So we're talking about the mayflies again. We're gonna start there. There's over hundred species in, in North America and at least 15 to 20 important ones here in New England. Um, and, and they range in hook, they have a widest range in hook sizes, anywhere from a 12 to a 22 in that range between the, the adults and, and the nymphs. And, and to, to Nick's point too, the difference I think in like the mayflies to the to the stoneflies and the caddisflies is there's, there's this concept called a, um, a complete metamorphosis and incomplete metamorphosis. <laughs> and it, the, the incomplete metamorphosis, like the mayflies, don't really have a pupa. They have a nymph that kind of looks something like the adult and they go through instar layers and then they become the adult in, in the dun and then the spinner form, which is just a change in the wings, uh, essentially, and then they die. But the, the like the caddis flies and the stone flies, and midges go through this complete metamorphosis, which egg, larvae, pupae, like Nick was saying, the real vulnerable stage is the pupa stage when they kind of just, they're dormant, they're just growing inside this case to become adults. So that's kind of just not to put too fine a point on the, this, the life cycle of, of those insects. Um, so, so one of the best ones you should definitely have in your fly box is atoms in a whole bunch of different colors and a bunch of um, different sizes. I would say anywhere from, from the 12, uh, on up to you know 16s in the atoms and and I have a friend that just fishes on the top which is so handicapping yourself. Um, Ninety percent of the fish, especially trout, are caught under the film. So using nymphs and, and pupa forms are really really important. But some people are in love so much with taking fish off the top they they'll only take fish off the top and there's no match in the hatch for them. They're throwing top water in the dead of the winter. It doesn't matter. Um, so they they load their box with Adams, and Adams is one of the world famous, um, you know, uh, mayfly imitators. And and the pheasant tail nymph is a good nymph imitator of the mayfly. There is other ones too, but it's one of the common ones and easier ones to tie. Um, boy, we would need a whole class to go into all the different ones. I'm just going to quickly sum summarize it here. The adult, the caddis now, the trichoptera. There's there's a bazillion, more than a thousand species in North America, and they're a huge food source for trout as as Nick said, and they range mostly from eight to 16, very common at 10 or 12 between the, the, the larvae and the caddis. And they go through this complete metamorphosis where they pupate as well, like Nick was explaining. Um, so the, the adult caddis has this tent wing pattern. So most of the flies you're gonna see, like the elk hair caddis has this, with, with, the, with the elk hair on uh, as, the, as the wings in, in this tent shape. Um, and, and this is one of the world famous, you know, adult caddis. It's similar, so have a bunch of elk hair caddis in, in, in sizes, you know, 12 and 14 in, in different colors and you can't go wrong. And then there's no real name for these. I had these little guys, these caddis larvae in my fly box. Um, I may have tied them or I may have gotten them, bought them years ago, uh, but, but there's a lot of different, obviously, because the caddis, there's the spinning caddis, there's the, the 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 free free swimming. There's the you know the 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 ones that make their own uh, pupa. So uh, cases. So there's so many different ones and so many different ones. Even that that mop fly actually uh, it tries to imitate. And it's so simple to tie. Look look up mop fly in YouTube and it's so easy. 
So that's one that, that, that'll imitate a caddis larvae. So these were just a couple I had in my fly box that really look like the larvae of, of caddis. Uh, so stone flies are some of the biggest um, of, of, of the flies. They're in the, the order of Plecoptera, thousands of species worldwide. And they're bigger, so four to 10 hook size. And the one on the left I like is just a foam body, really easy sheet foam, black or brown sheet foam with these with these elastic legs and, and a little bit of, um, uh, not chenille, a little bit of the uh, flashaboo for the antenna uh, on, a, on a size four or six, it, um, knocks it out of the park. It, it sits right on the surface, you can see it. And again, for those that like a dry fly. And the beadhead uh, prince nymph doesn't just imitate the stonefly larvae, but it's one of the major one that does in the larger sizes, um, you know, the four sixes and eights on those for the, for, for the stonefly larvae. Um, but you want to have that in your box uh, big time. And especially if you see nothing rising, nothing going on, start fishing nymphs off the bottom. Don't be that purist. And the midges, the midges, as Nick Nick uh, pointed out, they are not the, the uh, they are the sport, poor stepchild of the, the fly fishing world. But boy, if you if you're fishing slower waters in particular, uh, rivers and streams, um, they're going to make up a tremendous amount of the of the food resources for for trout. So just have a, a tremendous, you know, and I can't time anymore my eyes. <laughs> I need the magnifying glass in front of me because in sizes 22 to 28 is is pretty near microscopic for me now, but in a lot of different colors um, in, 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 in those sizes, you can't go wrong. And you're gonna see them particularly on the swift. There's a lot of these little white uh, midges um, rising right through the year, even in the middle of the winter. So you can't go wrong with those. You catch a lot of little brook trout that come up and sip them. And then the zebra midge, which is a classic midge pattern um larvae pattern so those are the four major groups there there are just a bazillion more as next say we would need two hours to go through all the flies i just want to give you a taste um so two of the best books ernie ernie um schreiber's ancient book written in the 1950s but updated a few times and in in i think as late as the 80s early 90s matching the hatch it's like the bible for matching the hatch if you're interested in that science that science of fly fishing grab that book and there's a lot of great books on matching the hatch. And don't match the hatch if you don't want. I'm here to say it. If you don't feel like matching the hatch, don't bother. Um, it, it, you know, th there's there's a lot to be said for just, you know, um, the woolly bugger, like Nick was saying. <laughs> that, that could be a leech. It, it, it could be a, you know, a caddis fly. It could be so many different things. And when you're scratching your head, you don't know, throw throw a bead-headed woolly bugger in a variety of colors, whether it's all in black or brown. And or chartreuse, and you'd be surprised. Um, this book, uh, the one on the right, 24 Greatest Flies um, that you don't want to leave home without is one of our better instructors, Rob, Bob Sousa, former U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist, retired in fly fishing extraordinaire. He has two books. Um, this one is his, his Tour de Force on the Best Flies, and, and you will not go wrong with this one. And he also has one, Learn to Fly Fish in 24 Hours. So. Uh, two good, really good resources, but there's obviously a billion in print. Um, online resources, I picked these as, as kind of the best of the best, um, particularly a global fly fisher. They're, you're going to get this as the PDF, so you can just click on it and go to it. But all of these talk have articles on the biology of fly fishing, on matching the hatch, on water quality, on what you can do to improve the habitat. So these are some of the better online sites and join an organization, whether it's Trout Unlimited or, or close to home, the New England, um, the New England Fly Tires. There's one here. I live out near Springfield in the Quabbin Reservoir area, right near Swift River, Western Mass Fly Fishermen. Uh, they call themselves a need and love, though they're a great tying and fishing organization that does education programs. Orvis and L.L. Bean are more known as, as, as um, NGO stores um, that you can go to to buy stuff, but they also offer a lot of content on education. They'll, they'll have classes on fly tying, on fly fishing, some for paid, but a lot of them free. So don't discount those two giants, um, but there's a ton of them, but those are just examples here, folks. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Jacqueline, who's gonna wrap up. And then if you have any questions, we can we can get into those. So I, th I think maybe we'll take a few questions before I before I wrap up with my slides. Excellent. So um, if you want to unmute yourself, you can, or you can type a question into the chat box. Questions, comments, concerns, it doesn't have to be questions. If you have critiques of us and how we can make it better, I, or, or I, I, down, I, that's fine too. I have a question. I, I sure. um, first of all, thanks, thanks a lot. This has been really uh, informative. I was late, so I'm 
looking forward to seeing the beginning of it and the recording. But I'm a total beginner. I'm getting ready to get started here, and I'm trying to figure out what to spend money on first. Dry and wet flies. When we talk about dry flies versus wet flies, are we talking about um, dry fly is on top of the water and wet fly is below the water? Or Okay. In, I'll take it quick, Nick. You'll, I'm sure you have a lot more to add. Um, in, in broad terms, yes, the dry fly is is the classic what you fish on the top. Um, there's a lot of nuances within that. And then the, the, the wet fly is your nymph stages of those insects. Um, again, in broad terms. So dig into that a little bit more. There's a lot of variety within that. There's emergers, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of nuances, but right in the in the broad terms, the dries and the wets, and focus on the wets if you want to catch more fish. That's my largest tip, the biggest tip I can give you. Oh, good tip. Okay. Yeah, and just just to add on what Jim was saying, I think the uh, you know knowing knowing where in the water column, ooh, sorry, knowing where in the water column you're fishing is really important. So you know if you're fishing underneath the water, um, trying to figure out are they are they feeding right on the bottom? Do you need to add a lot of weight to that? Or are they, you know, kind of taking emergers right near the surface? And are they kind of feeding in the middle of the water column? So when you're fishing underneath the water, you know, trying to figure out a couple different depth zones and seeing what works the best is is really helpful. Um, so 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 when you're using a wet fly, then you you should use a, use a um, a a bead. Uh, I mean a, a bead weight on it on on it to get it down to the depth that you want. Is that what you're saying? So there are a couple different ways of doing that. There are a lot of uh, flies that have bead heads yep. on them that are either made out of copper or tungsten. Um, yep. Sometimes they also have heavy wire on them. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are also weights that you can add to your leader as well. Uh, I really like using the bead heads because they don't have any lead in them and they're very, um, very easy to get down there. Um, yep. And for, but, trout, uh, for do, trout depth in, in warm and cold water, in the summertime, when it gets really hot, I'm assuming they go deep, right? And then, so so you have to figure it that way, right? So w what temperatures are we talking about when they're going to be like at um, mid mid range? Any ideas? What water is it dependent on the water temperature or the air temperature? Probably probably the water, right? Absolutely. Well, it's the, ultimately it's the water, uh, but the air temperature and the in the the sun angle is going to change within whatever water body you're fishing, right? And that's going to dictate where these fish are going to be within the water column. To the dead of the summer in August, when it's you know the water temps on the surface in the 80s, say you have 50 feet of water in in your in your uh, water body that you chose, then they're going to be pretty close to the bottom at that point of year. So, but they're going to yeah. be at different levels depending on the time of year. Like in October when it could get hot, the sun angles a little a little deeper, right in the sky. So maybe it's not as, yeah, I gotcha. Okay, cool. Yep. Thanks. Yep. In October, the sun That's angles a lot info. lower. You may get a hot day, but the water's not going to heat up that quick in response to it. So the fish are going to be up higher on the water column, or or even okay. at the surface. Oh, thank you. Excellent questions, Pat. Thanks. Looks like we have a few questions in the chat. One is on the copies of the presentation slides. We will be sending a PDF of all the presentations in one um, file to all the participants tonight. The uh, presentations also being recorded and, and will be made available at the city of Worcester Lakes and Ponds uh, webpage. Um, so we'll, you'll, you'll be definitely getting those resources afterwards. Um, so no worries about that. If you uh, miss something and you didn't get a chance to write it down. Um, another question, um, is, is more for the state. I believe, uh, curious if, uh, Massachusetts has any more plans to designate more sections of different rivers, fly fishing and catch and release only. I wish every river had a section. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> not immediate plans. Um, it is so complicated to do that because there's so many different user groups and generally I hate to break it to you, but fly fishing is 1 of the smaller niche niche user groups within fishing. So when we, even when we have done them historically over the years, we catch a tremendous amount of flack from. From other anglers, so I hear what you're saying. It would be cool if we could designate a small section. And I'm not going to say it won't happen going forward, but at, at time to answer your question specifically, there's no immediate plans to add any to what we have right now. Uh, can I ask another question while we're waiting here? 
Um, yeah. and, and this might be might be sacrilegious. I, I live I live near Ca- the Cape, and I'd like to do some uh, like striped bass fishing with with fly gear. Is what do you recommend for that? Yeah, I know that sounds like fun, huh? <laughs> Nick, I'll let you answer that one, and if you don't, I'll answer. So, so yeah, I've, I've actually never fly fished for stripers, but I know it's very popular. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, I know people will fish from boats; they'll fish from the surf, and uh, you know, stripers can be fantastic uh, uh, sport fish on the fly. I know that uh, common patterns that people you will use is that like people love clouds or minnows um, for for stripers. They'll also use uh, crab patterns. And even some of the some of the shrimp patterns that crab and shrimp patterns that are used, um, you know, down south for bone fishing and permit fishing. Um, so I'd look look into you know resources on saltwater fly fishing, and you should you should be able to find some some good patterns and methods. I don't know, Jim, if you have any any specific striper fishing experience. I, I'm not too much of a saltwater angler. I, I do, but it was more in my younger days with spinning gear, living out here in the western part of the central, the western part of the state. I'm mostly a freshwater fly fisherman, but a freshwater fly angler. But I would just say, Pat, to start with, you're going to need to upsize your gear. Yeah. Um, you're going to need, in, in fly fishing, it's all about the weight of the, the rod and balancing mm-hmm. the line in your reel. So with saltwater fishing, you're going to need at least an eight weight, but preferably a nine weight um, rod and reel and line combination. Um, and, and typically fly anglers have a variety. You're going to have something for, for the smaller streams, like, like a three weight, uh, rod and reel, maybe a seven and a half foot three weight, and then all the way up to those nine or 10 weight, uh, nine, you know, 10 foot, uh, saltwater combination. So the fish are bigger. So you have to have, um, just heavier gear. So figure out what you're going to fish for and gear up for that. And there's a, like, like Nick, uh, pointedly mentioned, Clouser minnows are one of the world famous, um, Saltwater flies. They were actually developed, I believe, uh, for smallmouth fishing on the Susquehanna, but they've 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 expanded to the saltwater, and there's there's big heavy streamer patterns, and there's so many different ones too that you can tie and use in different colors. But it's a blast. Wind is going to be your your problem in saltwater. There's always a wind in the ocean, so you're going to have to learn to cut through that, with, and you're going to have to become a a a, a, be, a good caster. So I wouldn't start with saltwater. I would start on a freshwater lake. With with that six or seven weight, and learn how to wield that pretty good, and then and then work your way either down to the smaller fish or up to the larger fish. Yeah, I never thought about wind even on a lake. That's good oh. info. Oh yeah, especially this year. It's been so windy. Fish with it at your back. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, okay. That's how yep. it makes the most of it. Yeah. I I just uh, came in from fishing for striped bass. I was spent the afternoon. Oh great. Down on. You do, uh, Tom. Down on uh, Buzzards Bay. And uh, got yeah. my first fish of the year. So, and awesome. it was on a deceiver, which is a very another popular um, fly for uh, stripers, particularly in the Northeast. Lefty's right. deceiver. Yeah, nice. it's it's, yep. it's another great fly. So the, that and the clouds. As a matter of fact, I have my bench right behind me, and I'm, I got a bunch <laughs> of things with clouses on it, on there that I have just tied the heads on. I tie the heads on separately, and then I. I do the I glue them up good and then I do the bodies later on. So you have to. You're gonna get into bluefish if you're fishing for stripers, right, ex- Tom? And ex- they just exactly. destroy exactly. what you're offering. So I always carry a little wire with me. Yep. And Smart. I actually tie some uh, some longer shanked hooks. When I when the bluefish are mixed in with the bass, I use a really long shank hook, and that more often will save your fly. Beautiful. They'll hit the front of the they hit the front. Yep. So nice. instead of catching your your tippet. They're uh, <laughs> yep. they're eating wire. Smart man. <laughs> so we have another question from David. I like to fish very small, somewhat brushy streams. Is it possible to use wet flies or spinning gear with a small weight by just drifting across likely spot for trout? Nick, yeah, I'd say all day long with spinning gear and flies, absolutely. Yeah. I've used spinning gear on lakes under uh, uh, fly flies on lakes under a bobber. Uh, when we're not when when we've run out of bait, I'm fishing with my wife. I'll give her one of my flies. She'll fish with the bobber and she'll catch just as many fish as she would with a worm. So yeah, absolutely. You don't have to just use a fly rod. Flies on a fly rod, you can use it on spinning rods um, and just drift them. Drift those flies with a little bit of uh, weight. Sure. Yeah. 
as long as yep. it's non lead, if it's less than one ounce, it has to be a non lead split shot in Massachusetts and most of the Northeast to protect loons and other, um, other, um, um, birds actually waterfowl. All right, so with that, um, I'm, I'm just have 1 or 2 more slides for you. Um. If you have any additional questions, these are the emails um, to Jim and Nick. You can email them um, if, uh, if something comes to you later. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for that fantastic overview. And um, if all of you enjoy the presentation, please go and check out the other Angler event series programs that we have going on at wooanglerseries.com. Up next in May, we have a learn to fish event again with uh, with Jim um, from Mass Wildlife, um, as well as a virtual fishing derby with the town of Shrewsbury. Um, basically, you you go out over this one weekend and you get to take a picture of what you catch and and it's all entered to uh, to win prizes through uh, the city and the town of Shrewsbury. Um, this uh, um, recording. Um, of this presentation will be made available on the lakes and ponds webpage through the city of Worcester over the next few days. Um, and you could get there using this QR code or um, I'll send you a link in a follow up email um, with those other materials. So, finally, um, for those of you who haven't fished, fished in Worcester before, I encourage you to come and check it out. In Worcester, we actually have over 20 waterways from 5 to 500 acres in size. We have those warm species. We also have some some places where you could get those cold species in the lakes um, there. They go from like 1 to, to 85 feet deep. Um, we recently commissioned a survey um, where we um, had a contractor analyze how fishing has changed over time in four Worcester lakes um, and and through different surveys with anglers in the city. We identified over 20 species of fish. Um, and a lot of them are great game fish. So if you're looking for something in particular, you could access this angler survey um, and, and fish report um, on the city of Worcester lakes and ponds webpage. So um, come check out Worcester's fishing if you haven't already. So with that, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, thanks to our presenters and um, we hope to see you again real soon. Have a great night. Thank you everyone.